Thank you, Chancellor, very much. Governor, thank you for honoring us with your presence here today. Prime Minister Godwin and students, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you and uh, share this moment. If we celebrate our country, the United States of America, 4% of the population of the world, we have to ask the question, why was the light bulb, the telegraph, the telephone, the airplane, the internet, the global positioning system, why were all these things invented by just 4% of the population of the world? This nation every year writes more plays, more copyrights, more inventions, more symphonies, more books, more Nobel Prize winners than the rest of the world combined. Half of the people on earth live on less than $2 a day. Half of those live on less than $1 a day. We saw what went on in China, 330 million. More people in China live on less than $1 a day than exist in all of North America. And yet, when we hear our multimillionaire trial lawyers running for president talking about there's two Americas, you know not everybody makes it so well here. Let's just look at that fact and address it directly. If we want to talk about poverty in America, we might want to go to the Ozarks and Arkansas and say, you know, there's not everyone's a millionaire. Let's just take the state of Arkansas. That little tiny state produces more wealth, greater GDP than the sixth largest nation on earth, the 172 Pakistanis. You say, but I saw the picture of Katrina there. Now Louisiana, now people are struggling. I understand, that's true. And yet the four million Louisianans every year create more wealth than the fourth largest nation on earth, one of the world's largest oil producers. The nation of Indonesia's total GDP is not as large as the state of Louisiana. And then you say, well, what about Oklahoma? Oklahoma, those little three million Americans living in Oklahoma generate more wealth than the entire nation of the Philippines, 91 million people. If we're going to talk about poverty in the world, we need to look at what makes America so unique. The second richest spot on earth is Western Europe, France, Germany, Britain. In America, we have a level that we call poverty. A person, and you can check with the Heritage Poverty Study by Robert Rector, a person in poverty in America, that is, you walk into this country, you put your, sit down on a park bench, put your feet up, we will give free education to your children, unlimited access to the greatest health care system in the world, stamps for food, a roof over your head. A person in poverty in America is more likely to have a telephone, a television, an air conditioner, an automobile, eats more meat, more likely to own their home, and has greater square footage space than the average resident of the second richest spot on earth. Western Europe. Therefore, as one who loves America, it's appropriate to answer the question, why is that number one? And what do we think of those who want to change it? If there is a restaurant or a business on one side of the street that's prospering and a restaurant or business on the other side of the street that's failing, there's a reason. And if there's a church on one corner that's prospering and a church on one corner that's failing, there's a reason. And if there's a nation on one side of a river that's prospering and a nation on the other side of the river that's failing, there's a reason. And it's really not all that complicated, and yet if we don't understand why that is, then we might do the wrong thing. Now, you and I might not be expected to know how to come in and, and restore a collapsing business or, or whether or not we have the capacity to make a church prosper, but all of us have been entrusted with the responsibility of choosing the direction of our country. And we will be judged by generations to come on how we handle this privilege, as Lincoln once called it, the last best hope of mankind. Our generation was so lovingly handed it to us from those who built this great place, this great powerhouse, and our enemies are so committed to making it different. And so let's understand how politics works. It's not complicated. It's actually very simple. In fact, it's easy as pie. And 25 minutes from now, and for the rest of your life, you will be able to listen to a politician for 60 seconds and know whether or not he has you and your country's best interests at heart or not. And it works simply like this. Politics as easy as pie. Politics equals integrity plus economics. These are the only two things we vote on. I don't care if it's, it's in Belgium or Brazil. We only vote on two things. First of all, 
integrity. You know, as, as a politician, I had a concern. I would deal with people that were good people. And you go to rely on them and they weren't there and I couldn't quite figure out what the problem was because they were noble, moral folks. And I began to discover that integrity is, discover, is made up of two things. Integrity means it's trustworthy, it's reliable, you can count on it. You say this platform has integrity. And integrity is made up of two parts in my opinion. Number one is morality and I define morality as not doing what's wrong. Shalt not steal, shalt not lie, so, etc. But it's more than that. Edmund Burke said all that's necessary for tyranny to prosper is for good men to do nothing. You can lay in bed all day, you can be moral. So, so to have integrity, you, you need something else. And, and I define that as character, and character as doing what is right. And so, a little girl comes home from school one day and says, you know, everybody was picking on Sally today and calling her fatty, fatty and all, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it. That's good. You didn't do anything wrong. But did you have the character to stand up on her behalf and do what was right. Now, let, let me just make a simple little observation here. If you're not with the New York Times, you'll find this rather elementary, but it might be a revelation to them. That is this. You cannot do what is right if you're doing what's wrong. You cannot be a person of character if you lack morality. And so then, so I remember some time ago, the governor of New York at the time was on Larry King, and he was speaking about the president at, the, at that time, and he said, I would not trust him with my sister, but I know that in time of crisis, he will do what's best for my country. <laughs> no, 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 no. If, you, if your family can't trust you, uh, uh, the rest of, is, 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 well, it's his official job. It's like the bank president coming in. You know, I know he's been arrested three times for breaking and entering, but when he works here at the bank, he never take anything. No, no, a person, you cannot be a person of character if we lack morals. And so therefore you have to have morality first, and then, and then character. And character is doing what is right, and I define doing what is right as either one of two sources, and we're gonna come back to that. So just take that thought, put it over here on a shelf, and in 10 minutes, we're going to come back and conclude it. Let's go to the next step, and that is economics. Now, as one who majored in finance and economics, let me just tell you that, that here you're going to receive 95% of all the economics you'll ever need to know. And here it's very simply like this. If you look at that chart, and let's say that that's 100%, it's a $100 bill, or 100% of your income, or 100% of a state or a nation's income. And let us suppose that, that uh, you walk into a store and you have a $100 bill, and the most expensive thing in the store is $99. That means that you are completely free to choose anything in the store. You have complete freedom. As, as Milton Friedman said, you are free to choose anything. Now let us suppose that someone comes along and takes 25% away from you. Now you have less income, which has two impacts. Number one is that you have fewer choices. The amount of things that you can choose, fewer choices. Thomas Jefferson said freedom is having choices, and therefore the more choices I take away from you, the less freedom. Every teenager understands that. I want my freedom, make my own choices. Let, or you have, and you also have a lower standard of living. Now let us suppose that I take half of the money away from you, leave you with 50%. What happens? Fewer choices, lower. Suppose I take 75% away from you. You have fewer choices, even lower standards. Suppose I take it all. What do we call a person who works and gets to keep none of it? That person is called a slave. Now, <laughs> there are only two people that can take money away from you. Only two. One is a criminal, has a gun, and can take money away from you. And the other is the government has a gun and can take money away from you. <laughs> And there's going to be about four times this morning when I want to pause and have you hear exactly what I say. And that is, whether the money is taken from you or the mafia comes in at every Friday and takes a fourth out of your till, or whether a criminal with a ski mask comes in and takes it out of you on your way to your car in the parking lot, or whether you get out to your car and open up the paycheck and find half of it gone by Uncle Sam, the impact is the same. The greater the freedom, the greater the wealth, the greater is taken from you the loss of freedom, the greater the government, the greater the poverty. And so now that you understand that chart, you now know enough 
that fly any place around the world. You can land in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and then go to Buenos Aires, and then go to Cairo, and then go to Bangkok, then go to Vancouver, and then go to Philadelphia, and you can drive around in one hour and get back in the plane, and you will be able to place them on that chart and tell that the greater the freedom, once that principle applies, now, I remember as an economics major, I was told, no, 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 Bob, it has a lot to do with natural resources and climate and lots of other things. Well, at the end of the Korean War, they divided the, the Korean Peninsula in, into two, into north and south. And uh, same heritage, same culture, same climate. North Korea got socialism. And over the last five years, two and a half million people have starved. South Korea got freedom. And last year, they had the 10th largest GDP, the 10th richest nation on earth. Same heritage, same culture, same climate, same language. The greater the freedom, the greater the wealth. And that's what politics is all about. You and I choose which direction do we go now. <clears throat> now, very simply, how does that apply and how did our founders understand it? How does it translate into public policy? It works like this. There are only two ways to view people. And you say, Bob, you're telling me that a person, when you were growing up, Detroit was the richest city in America, and people came in and said, let's change that, and they did, and now it's the poorest of the major cities in America. Why would people do that to their country? When Britain was flat on its back in 1978, they elected a prime minister that made a change that cut taxes and put money back in people's top pockets, began to right the economy. It led the Europe for the next 12 years. Why, why, why do people do things? And it boils down to the way that we view each other. Every philosophical fight, every barroom brawl, every schoolyard scuffle, ultimate boils down to two words, and that is, who says? And the answer to who says is only two answers. One is, what I say, I shall decide. How do you feel about abortion? Well, I think. And the other is what God says. <laughs> Every fight. From that fork in the road, it then takes a direction that is very simple to understand. You simply listen to it. If you believe that man is in charge, if you believe that man created God, then you believe that man is his own standard. If you believe that God created man, then you believe that God is the standard. If you believe that man created God, then you believe that man is basically good. By what standard would he not be good? He's his own standard, so man is basically good. And it translates into very interesting ramifications in public policy. If man's basically good, someone comes in here and starts shooting people, it can't be his fault, he's good. So it's got to be the gun's fault. Got to get that gun, there's the problem. If you believe that man is, if you believe that God created man, then you recognize that man is in need of reform and that he is not inherently and basically good. If you believe that man is basically good and things go haywire, then obviously it's not his fault, it has to be the environment. And so if we just have enough more government programs to change the environment, if we just have more housing, and, and if, a, if a man is impregnating folks and, and, and not being a father, it can't be his fault, it's because they didn't have, pass out enough condoms in the classroom. There's the, there's the dilemma, you need, you need more programs to fix it because man, and finally, if you believe that God created man and he has a standard, then we are accountable for that standard. And finally, if you believe that man is the standard, then you believe in group rights. You believe it's because of your group, and you can listen to them for 30 seconds, and they'll always speak about a person not being a creation of Almighty God and unique in his existence, but because I am a woman, because I'm Hispanic, because I'm a Southerner, because I'm gay, because of, uh, some kind of right because of some group that a person belongs to, whereas our founders said very simply, your group isn't the source of your rights. God is the source of your rights. <laughs> Now, how does that, how does that <laughs> fixate? You say, Bob, you, you told us a minute ago that taking money away from people makes them poor. Why would, why would you, are you just contemptuous of government? You don't trust government to, to do good things? I mean, when the mafia comes and takes that money, they're helping the widows, don't you understand? And, and, when, when, and when, when the politician comes with his good smile and his beautiful teeth, you know he's for, it's for the children he's taking this. It, it works simply like this. 
Let us suppose that you're going to buy something for yourself. You care about two things. You care about price and quality. And nobody can judge that as well as you can. You might pay $3 for a cup of coffee at 7 in the morning. You wouldn't pay 50 cents at 2 in the afternoon. No, only you can judge how to do that. Let us suppose you're going to buy something for someone else. You still care about price because it's your money, but <laughs> you're a little more flexible on the quality. <laughs> Green, I think she'll like it. <laughs> That's called a second-party purchase. You're paying for it for someone else. Let us suppose that where you work, Everybody that comes to work late has to put $5 in the kitty. At the end of the month, they raffle the money off, and so it's the last of the day, the last of the month. The boss says to you, John, you're going to lunch. Count the money in the kitty and see if you can buy something for it. We'll raffle it off at the end of the day. You count it out. There's $150. You go to lunch. You're coming back. You think, oh, what am I going to do? And then you turn, and there in the store window is a six-foot-tall stuffed frog. And you go over and you check the price, and it says $149. Oh, this is great. This is exactly. So you buy the frog, and you go over and you put it in the closet. At the end of the day, the boss writes everybody down, lectures to them about being late. Everybody draws a number. Who see who wins? This is Sally, the new secretary. She wins. What does she win? Go over, open the door, six foot tall frog. Oh, everybody laughs and claps. This is so great. Go over and stuff it into her car. She drives off. Now, what is that? That is called a third party purchase. A third party purchase is purchasing something with money that's not yours, therefore you're not concerned about price, to purchase something you will not personally consume, therefore you're not concerned about quality. Here's the second time where I'm pausing for emphasis. Because what I'm about to say is not labor and socialist, it's not Democrat and Republican, it's very simply. By definition, all government purchases are third-party purchases made with money that's not theirs to purchase things they will not personally consume. Therefore, will there be waste in the highway department? You betcha. Will there be waste in the defense department? You can count on it. And every time we take money from an individual to run it through a third-party process, we are in the dilemma of making the nation poorer. It has to be done very cautiously. That's why we believe, as Abraham Lincoln said, the government should do only those things which we cannot do for ourselves. And America is the richest, most... America is the richest, most powerful nation on earth for one reason. Because we do less of that than any other nation. And you can just, yeah, can, now that you understand it, I can blindfold you in downtown Detroit. And we can just begin to drive through the, through the various suburbs. And you can find out as you change political jurisdictions, you find the principle, the greater the freedom, the greater the wealth, the greater the government, the greater the poverty. Now, how does that translate? You understand why people decide to do that. How does that translate into actual policy? And it works like this. Those who want to believe that wealth comes from what I take from you, and remember, government doesn't produce anything, no politician, he, they will always want more government. And there's an infinite capacity of noble ways to spend your money for you. Then there are those that believe in limited government, greater freedom. Those that believe in more government will always want more taxes. I don't care if they're running for mayor, running for governor, running for Congress, running for president. They will always want more taxes. And let me explain how they do that they learn that it's best that they not collect them because we get mad at the tax collector. And so they say, I won't tax you, I won't tax me, we're gonna tax the man behind the tree. And the process that we'll use is we'll use corporations. And we'll talk about those corporations and we're gonna tax those corporations. <laughs> Let me just give you a little, little piece of information. A corporation is a piece of paper. It doesn't walk, talk, or pay taxes. Only people pay taxes. But politicians have learned that if I can have the dairy company increase 20% of the cost of every glass of milk and they collect it for me, or gasoline a dollar and a half every time you purchase a gallon of gasoline and I can take a dollar and a half from there, that I can make you mad at them and I get to have the money. Every time you, out of the 17 largest oil producing companies in the world, none of them are American. ExxonMobil is the largest in America, and you hear politicians constantly screaming about how much profit they make. Every time they say that number, whatever it is, for any quarter, just remember this, three times that much 
went into the pocket of the politicians in taxes, but somehow or another they overlooked that. So these people always want more taxes. We believe in fewer taxes, of course, because we want more. Thirdly, these people will always want weak defense. Every dollar that's spent for defense is one less program. And so rest assured, you'll see change next year as to whether or not there is money for defense. These people always believe in a strong defense. Now, if you're Katie Couric, this frustrates you. You will say, no, you people always want a smaller government and fewer taxes, but you always support def a strong defense. The answer to that is right, exactly, and here's why. You see, limited government gives us more freedom. Fewer taxes gives us more freedom. A strong defense protects our freedom, and that's what government should do. And finally, And finally, these folks, because they define for themselves, they will always advocate for diverse lifestyles, whereas those who believe that God sets the standard, that he defined what marriage was. Where those who believe that they're the standard, they can say that they believe that marriage is between two men and a horse. And then they can write a law that would put you in jail for what you just did. They can define a hate crime should you not agree with their position. And the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, when it was considered in the Congress, there was a proposal by this congressman from Texas to say, how about if we exempt a minister of the gospel reading from the Bible in his own pulpit? And it was defeated on a party line vote in committee because they said, that's what we're headed toward. We want to be able to define what you can say and cannot say. The greater the government, the greater the poverty, the greater the freedom, the greater the wealth. And every time we go to the ballot box, we choose which direction we're going to go. All right, you say, Bob, how did this happen? What, what makes us so different? Our founders, this isn't, none of this is new. They've been thinking about it for thousands of years, and they got together and they wrote a birth certificate that understood, let's define where our rights come from, and they said this, we hold these truths. <laughs> now, that's enough to de deny your tenure at a lot of colleges already, after there is a truth, but we, we hold these truths to be self-evident, <laughs> which is a gracious Jeffersonian way of saying, any idiot ought to understand this. <laughs> we, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now notice the sequence. See, life, then liberty. See, liberty isn't of much value if you're dead. So, so you have to preserve life first. And that, that's what government does, that, to, to secure these rights. And, and so they, they establish, that, to, lest anybody understand that whether or not they're, this is what they're supposed to do, and don't tell me this, you know, I don't want to get involved, to secure these rights for this cause, governments are instituted among men. This is what they do. This, is what you're, this isn't above your pay grade. If you're going to be in politics, this is what you better do. This, it's your responsibility to do this. Now, at the same time we were establishing our independence, the other, remember the, who says, the other side was having a revolution as well in France. And their theme was that uh, they wanted to have liberty and equality and fraternity. That is, uh, what's another word for fraternity? Group. What's another word for group? Union. What's another word for union? Soviet? Uh, because, of my, because of my group, because of my Soviet that I belong to, I have rights. Now, because of my group, I have rights, and therefore, I demand equality. How do you get equality? You have to take from one person and give to another. What happens when you take from people? They object. What happens when they object? You have to kill them. And so the symbol of the French Revolution was the guillotine. And wherever that idea goes, no respect for God who gave us life. Thomas Jefferson said it right there, the God who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time. When you sever from God, then when you, when you, when you are, are no longer tied to God as the 
creator of life, then life is no longer sacred and the group becomes supreme so that when Pol Pot takes over in Cambodia, he can kill two and a half million people, anybody who wears glasses or can read a book or owns a foreign automobile, can kill people at will. When Hitler takes over, he can kill 12 million people, six million Jews, six million Catholic priests and others. When Liz and I would, would travel in the Soviet Union, when our little minders at the end of developing a relationship after a week or so, I'd always ask him, how many people do you think Stalin killed in Russia? The answer that came back was only in the neighborhood of 60 million. Our liberal history books say 35 million. No matter how you slice it, it's a lot of folks. When, when Che Guevara shot 400,000 people when Castro took over in Cuba, their program is always leads to death. Now, what separates us from God? This nation was, was tied to God. What is, what is the term for something that separates us from God? Anything that separates us from God is called sin. And sin, when it is conceived, bringeth forth death. The wages of sin is death. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What are the ways of death? Abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, right to die legislation, drug addiction, alcoholism, death. But I am come that you might have life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He that hath the Son hath life. And so you have a life and death struggle. And that's why, that is why, that is why there is such a tremendous effort to take God out of the pledge, to take the, the cross off of a city seal, to attack the Boy Scouts and not allow them in a public building because they believe in God and country. That's why they work night and day to separate us from God. Once they separate us from God, then there is no protection for life. And you can listen to a politician for 60 seconds, and where do you stand on preserving life? And then you know each step from there on. But, as Ronald Reagan said, freedom is not in our DNA and it's not in our soil. It's entrusted to every, every generation to preserve. After 12 years of independence, we had 13 separate countries, separate foreign policies, separate currencies. They decided to meet back in the same place where they'd written the Declaration of Independence back in 1776. They met there for six weeks and could agree upon absolutely nothing. 50% of the people lived in three states. 50% of the people lived in 10 states. There's no way around that. Four states said we want to continue slavery. Half of the population of Philadelphia at that time had been slaves at some time, including Benjamin Franklin. They said, no, 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 we want to make everybody a citizen, not like Rome where there are slaves and citizens. We want everybody. And they, they could not agree, and they began to break apart. Benjamin Franklin, who had played a major part in the independence, was 80-some years old. He was elderly. He had not spoken. But as he saw that this opportunity to start a new country was slipping through our fingers, he asked to speak for the very first time, and he said very simply this. He said, Mr. President, he said, the small progress that we have made after four or five weeks is proof of the imperfection of human understanding. That is that we have gone back to ancient history and models of government and criminals and examined the different forms which now no longer exist. He said, we've viewed modern states from all around Europe but find none of their constitutions suitable for our circumstances. Let me pause here for a moment. Wisdom is the proper use of knowledge. Knowledge is good, but you need wisdom. You can teach a 10-year-old how to drive. You don't throw your keys to a 10-year-old because he lacks the wisdom, the proper use of knowledge. Wisdom comes from two sources. Wisdom comes from experience, either your own or someone else's. But there are some things we've never done before. We've never gone through the fifth year of a marriage with a three-year-old and a two-year-old. There's some things we've just never done before. And the scripture says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. He doesn't scold us for asking. He says, so... Benjamin Franklin says, so now we've done this. We've looked at experiences. We've viewed modern states all around Europe. We find none of their constitutions suitable to our circumstances. And in this situation, groping in the dark, to find political truth, we have not once thought of humbly applying to the Father of Lights to illuminate our understanding. In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers were, he were heard and they were graciously answered. And have we now forgotten this powerful friend or have we become French and imagine we no longer need his assistance? <laughs> Sir, I have lived a long time. 
And the, more I li- the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. If Sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his ma- notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. I therefore move that prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessing on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. With that, they adjourn. They went across the street for three days of prayer and then they met back and began over the next five weeks to write the Constitution of the United States of America, creating the oldest government on earth. Every government on earth has changed since that time. It's one of the youngest nations, but it's the oldest government on earth. And they said, since we understand where our, from where our rights come, and since we understand God's blessing in putting this together, let us make sure that we preserve it. Therefore, we shall say in every official document, done in this the year of our Lord, the 2008th, and of the independence of the United States, the 232nd. And shall we say that anybody who, who takes a position of public trust, that he will, he will put his hand on the Bible and swear allegiance that God is the source of our rights, and then Congress Congress shall never meet. If Congress meets today for five minutes to take a message from the Senate, the speaker will bang the gavel, they will ask God's blessing, they'll accept the message, bang the gavel, and adjourn. Congress in the United States of America has never met for one moment without first calling upon God in prayer. The United States is a unique, special place because it understands that God is the source of our rights, so Jews can be chased out of every spot on the planet, and they can come here under the canopy of protection that is the United States. And there are those who want to change our association, our tradition, our history, that makes us, then they want us to be just like any other country, and when they do it, if they do it, there will be no place for us to go. And that is why what you are about to do is very, very important. I know that you will choose the leadership for our country that understands that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord.